Today we're going to look at a brief overview of the second derivative test for multivariable functions. But before we do that, let's recall what the second derivative test says for single variable functions. And this is the kind of thing that you would learn in a class that would be called Calculus 1 in the US. So throughout this video, we're going to assume that all appropriate derivatives of our function exist and are nice. And so you can like put more restrictive hypotheses on this if you want to, but for this broad overview, we won't worry about it. Okay, so like I said, from calculus one or a single variable differential calculus class, we would say that a real number a is a critical point of a function f if f prime evaluated at a equals zero. And let's recall that critical points give you the possibility of having a maximum or a minimum. And in order to test whether that critical point's a maximum or a minimum, you often employ something called the second derivative test. So here's like essentially what the second derivative test says with a couple of details left out. So if f double prime of a is negative, then the point a comma f of a is a local maximum. So if the second derivative is negative, then you have a local maximum. Then if the second derivative of f evaluated at a is positive, then a comma f of a is a local minimum. Notice this leaves out the case when the second derivative is equal to zero. And in that case, you could have a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. In other words, something known as a saddle point. So let's maybe do a quick move of this notion of a critical point to functions from r n to r. And then we'll fix n equal to two and look at what is generally given in a first multivariable calculus class as the second derivative test, maybe discuss a couple of problems with it, and then maybe fix it. Okay, so if you want the critical point to be where the derivative is equal to zero, but you're working over multivariable functions, then you might say that the critical point is where all partial derivatives are zero. And I think that's a reasonable thing to do. So let's write that here. So we say that a number a, which comes from rn, so perhaps this is a list of numbers, or you could think of it as a vector, is a critical point, so I'll still call it a critical point, of f if the partial derivative of f with respect to xi evaluated at x equals a equals zero for all i between one and n. But let's recall that we can wrap all partial derivatives into an object, and that object is called the gradient. So this is if and only if the gradient of f evaluated at a is equal to the zero vector. And again, let's recall how the gradient is defined. So we could do that right here in this box. So the gradient of f is given by the vector, the partial with respect to x1 of f up to the partial with respect to xn of f. And here I've built in this new shortened notation for the partial derivative of f with respect to x1, just this del sub 1. And then this del sub n will be the partial with respect to xn. So if we wanted to be explicit about that, we'll just say that del i of f is equal to the partial of f with respect to xi. So that's a nice shortening, I think. Okay, now, like I said, we're gonna set n equal to two and now explore what's generally given as the second derivative test inside of a calculus three class or a multivariable calculus class in the US. Okay, so it goes something like this. So if the second partial of f with respect to x is bigger than zero, so I'll denote that as del x squared operating on f. Here we're thinking since we have n equals two that are two variables instead of being x1, x2 are x and y. 
This is often written as f sub x x is bigger than zero, where those subscripts correspond to taking the partial derivative with respect to x twice. Okay, so that's our setup. We've got this second partial is positive. And then from there, there are two cases. And those two cases are kind of similar to these two cases over here. So the first case will be if the second partial with respect to x times the second partial with respect to y minus the square of the mixed partials is less than zero, then we have a maximum. So we still have this thing where some object is less than zero and we get a maximum just like this over here. But in this case, the thing that's less than zero is in fact equal to this weird combination of the second partial with respect to f, the second partial with respect to y, and the square of the mixed partials. So this is great for the two variable case, but it's not at all clear how this will generalize. So that's what we're hoping to do here is to generalize this to the invariable case in a way that's like a little bit more clear and simplifies very quickly to what we have over here. So this doesn't simplify quickly to the one variable case. Okay, now let's look at the other setup here and that would be if this object second partial with respect to x, second partial with respect to y minus the mixed partials is less than zero, we have a minimum. Okay, so now that we've recalled all of this stuff from calculus one, single variable calculus and standard multivariable calculus, I'd like to define the object that makes this generalization of the second derivative possible. So the object that will play the role of the second derivative for our real multivariable second derivative test will be something called the Hessian matrix. So this matrix is made up of all possible second derivatives of a function. So they're grouped together into this n by n matrix. So notice the first entry is the second partial with respect to x1. So I've written that as del1, del1 on f. And then we've got del1, del2 on f all the way up to del1, del n on f. So that would be taking the partial with respect to x in first and then the partial with respect to x1. But let's recall, because we're making our niceness assumptions about our functions, this is a symmetric matrix. So in other words, the first partial order doesn't matter. So we've got del n del 1 of f is the same as this up here. Then notice way down here at the bottom right, we have the second partial with respect to x in. And now that we've got this thing called the Hessian, we're ready to state the following theorem. Maybe in a video in the future, maybe on the second channel, we'll do a proof of this. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a critical point. So let's recall the critical points happen when the gradient is equal to zero. Then here are our two conditions. So if all of the eigenvalues of the Hessian evaluated at A are negative, then a f of a is a maximum. So there's that negativeness implying a maximum. Then if all of the eigenvalues of h of a are positive, then we have a minimum. And of course, if some are negative and some are positive, we have a saddle point. And if some of them are zero and some of them are negative or some of them are zero and some of them are positive, then the test is somewhat inconclusive. So now we're gonna look at a fairly simple example. So let's consider the function f of x, y is x squared minus two x plus three y to the fourth plus four y cubed minus 12y squared. So we'll first find the critical points, but we'll do that instead of setting the gradient equal to zero, we'll set each first partial equal to zero. That's equivalent. So the partial with respect to x is equal to two x minus two because all of those y's will go to zero. But notice this tells us that x is equal to one. So that's a fairly simple equation to solve. Now let's see what we get for setting the partial of y with respect to zero. Uh, so this will give us 12y cubed plus 12y squared minus 
24y. So we can factor, let's see, a 12y out and we'll be left with y squared plus y minus two. And then we can factor that y squared plus y minus two. That'll factor like, let's see, 12y times y plus two y minus one. Setting that equal to zero, we see that we get y equals zero, y equals negative one, and y equals, or y equals positive one, and y equals negative two. So all together, that gives us three critical points. We have x is always one, and then y can take on these three values. So let's summarize that, and then we'll test each of those critical points using our theorem. So we just determined our critical points, and now we're ready to test them with our Hessian matrix. So let's calculate the Hessian matrix first. So this top left entry will be the second derivative of f with respect to x. So that'll simply be equal to two. So we can see that that's equal to two just by taking the second derivative of the x part given that the derivative of the y part is zero. But let's also notice that our off diagonal entries are equal to zero. And that's because this is a pure function of x plus a pure function of y. So we'll have zero, zero there. And that makes this whole process of finding the eigenvalues extremely simple. Maybe like a little too simple, but I think this is a good first example nonetheless. Okay, then let's take our second partial with respect to y. So notice we'll have four times three and then three times that, that'll give us 36 y squared and then plus Let's see, three times four gives us 12 times two, so that will be 12y, and then finally minus 24. So there's our Hessian. So let's see if we can simplify this bit a little bit. So I can most definitely factor a 12 out. If I factor a 12 out, I get three y squared, and then plus y minus two. And now does that factor? Well, let's check. We'll have 12 and then we have three y and then y. So we'll need to put a plus two or a minus two in one of them and a plus one and a minus one in the other one. And I think what works is a minus two here and a plus one here. Okay, so that's looking good. And now that gives us a kind of nicer version of our Hessian of, two, zero, zero, and then we'll have 12, three y minus two times y plus one. And from here, we need to evaluate this at our critical points and see what the matrix turns into. So let's do those one at a time. So let's say here we're evaluating at the critical point one, negative two. So what matrix will that give us? So we'll have two, zero, zero, that'll never change. And then plugging negative two into this, we'll have 12, that'll give us negative six minus two, which is negative eight. So, so far we have negative 96, and then that's gonna be times negative one, so that'll be positive 96. So we have something like that. But what are the eigenvalues there? Well, since it's a diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are simply on the diagonal. So that tells us that this will give us some sort of minimum if we plug it into the function. Okay, so now let's next plug in one zero maybe. Okay, so that gives us two zero zero, and then plugging zero in here, we'll have 12 times negative two, that's negative 24 times one. So in the end, we have negative 24. So that has an eigenvalue of negative 24, which is negative, so that makes this a saddle point. In other words, it's neither a maximum nor a minimum. Okay, now let's finally plug in our last critical point, so our last critical point will be the point one, one. Okay, so that gives us two, zero, zero. That's the same for all of these like we pointed out. 
And then plugging one in here, we'll have 12. And then this gives us three minus two, which is one. And then one plus one, which is two. So in the end, we get 24. Again, we've got two positives there. That tells us that in fact, we have also a minimum just like before. So if you're still around and you like what you saw, maybe consider liking this video, giving a comment, as well as subscribing to the channel if you haven't yet. If you'd like to support the cause of spreading math more broadly, you could consider joining the Patreon. There's a link for that in the description. And that's a good place to stop.